Hi everyone, this week we are going to start taking a look at chapter four around predictive analytics. We'll talk a good bit about some the data mining process, some methodology with that, as well as look at a couple of different data mining algorithms, one of which, one of which will be our homework assignment for, for this week. So let's get started with some concepts and definitions um, uh, really around data mining or why we even do data mining. Um, part of this is driven by just more competition in likely mostly our business environments uh, at the global scale and folks trying to understand what consumers will do based on their historical uh, use patterns, historical purchasing patterns, things of that nature, so that they can try to use that as the newer competitive advantage and, and stay above, stay in front of everyone else. It's the recognition of the value in the data sources. So we've been collecting data for a lot of years and, and many would argue that no one exactly knows why or what we're collecting. We've just collected it all and, and hoping to find out something that we can do with it. As we look at those giant data sets, we can see advancements in medicine uh, as one of those key benefits where all of a sudden collection of data on the level of hundreds of millions of people or potentially billions of people have uh, brought medical breakthroughs. And there's certainly a lot of uh, ad advantages to doing this in our business environments as well. Uh, <clears throat> as we have matured in the concept of gathering and, and uh, hoarding data, so to speak, data quality on the customers, vendors, and everything that they're doing, purchasing, what have you, uh, is, is starting to improve to the level, or is improved to the level, that it is profoundly useful. Consolidation integration of all of these repositories that either a business have or has or multiple businesses have into one large data warehouse has really ushered in uh, more utility for big data. The increase in processing and storing capabilities as well as the decrease in cost in doing all of that with the economies of scale. And the movement of conversion from information resources to the non-physical form basically means moving from a paper-based society to one uh, one based around computers and, and databases as we have today. So uh, starting off with a definition of data mining, the, this, the author of Faid here is, is just one example. Uh, there are many and you could probably ask one person, they can give you five different examples of data mining, but the non-trivial process, meaning the kind of laborious process in some instances of identifying valid, novel, unique, uh, potentially useful and ultimately understandable patterns in data stored in structured databases. And we are primarily for this class thinking about structured databases, uh, and we'll talk about other types of databases as we go on. Keywords here to think about the process, non-trivial means it's uh, um, and not an easy lift. It's, it definitely takes a bit of work, valid data, novel, unique in that instance. Um, and uh, potentially useful and understandable. Is data mining a misnomer? Um, yes and no. Um, you could go into a cave mining some kind of mineral and sifting through tons and tons of non-useful um, aggregate while you look for the little bit of trace minerals that can actually help you or be beneficial or even um, even create profit. We can think of data mining as the same way, combing through millions and millions or hundreds of millions of rows of data looking for patterns of use that can help us predict what's coming next and, and ultimately add value to our business and to our consumers lives some other names knowledge extraction pattern analysis knowledge discovery we'll talk a little bit about that as well information harvesting and and so on um, for me data mining fits the bill just fine what are some of the different disciplines that come together one of the biggest ones is statistics, and and there's even a little bit of a chicken a chicken and the egg between data mining and statistics. Which which is which? Which is more important, and perhaps which came first? So we have AI, machine learning, ML, uh, the informational visualization. That's where we kind of take all this data and um, produce graphs and and scorecards and dashboards and all that great stuff. Data management, data warehousing management science and information systems all around how we use that data to uh, to run our business. Data mining characteristics and some objectives. 
a source of data for data mining is often some kind of consolidated warehouse. And if we think about a business and all of its different aspects from HR to purchasing and marketing and accounts receivable and payable and so, so forth and all of their respective databases, consolidating that all into one data warehouse where we can get a really good view all the way across the organization of what's happening, what we do well, what we don't do well, where there may be waste and <clears throat> where there may be chance to have some more profit. Data mining environment is usually a client server or a web-based. Um, you're usually using some kind of an application and reaching back into uh, on your local computer and then reaching back into a server architecture that may be remote or somewhere else in your building. Um, data is the most critical element. Uh, it is the biggest thing that we're, we're looking for and is in fact what we're sifting through. Uh, the miner here is often an end user. Uh, it could be someone whose job is in business intelligence or data analytics who is trying to uh, comb through the data to help their, their team, their company solve a problem. Uh, striking it rich with data mining involves uh, some creative thinking. How do you interpret the hundreds or thousands or millions of rows of data that you're sifting through um, and then doing something meaningful with it? There's an art and a science to everything, and this is certainly no different. Some of the tools and the capabilities and ease of use are essential. We can use um, a lot of commercial off-the-shelf or often called COTS commercial off-the-shelf software. Uh, to do this, there are also certain things that you can develop in R, and we'll talk about some different applications in just a little bit that you can use to do this. Um, with the rise in parallel processing that we have with servers that are much more capable than doing one task at a time, um, searching through multiple parts of the database at the same time and aggregating those results together have made it a lot easier and faster uh, for even novice users to begin doing data mining. So how does this thing actually work? How does this concept actually work? This is to extract the patterns in data. Um, a pattern could be mathematical, a numeric, a symbol, relationship among data. It could be how often um, something comes up. Uh, we learned a little bit ago about median and mode, mode being the um, amount of times that any specific number or item appears. Uh, those are certainly patterns that we can begin to identify. We have association types of patterns. Um, think about a shopping cart that we often notice that if someone buys chips, they probably also buy dip. If someone is buying um, produce, they may also buy salad dressing and, and certain things. If they're buying um, ketchup, they may also buy mustard. Or if they're buying hot dogs, they buy buns. Those are association patterns. And, and that is going to be part of what we do for our homework. There's cluster, we can segment a market around the different types of consumers and their spending or their products or their habits or their, their preferences. And sequential, we can watch how something happens over time and watch those relationships, uh, the cyclical nature of how people buy clothes or um, how people shop for the holidays or around, uh, obviously Super Bowl planning tends to be a big one when you see all the soda, beer and chip ads out. I have a little bit of taxonomy here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, we're going to go through these uh, in more detail in the coming slides. I just kind of have them uh, pulled all together for us in, in one graph, and this is uh, from our textbook as well. Um, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll handle most of these individually. So some other data mining patterns or the tasks. Again, the time forecast, uh, the time forecasting. Is it part of a sequence or a link analysis? Um, and I, you know, ideally we'll be looking at patterns over time and try to identify that sequence there. Then we bring a visualization. This is often the second component or well, last component, I should say, of pulling together our data for management to make their decisions. You can't present your management team with tens of thousands of rows of data and say, here you go, go make some decisions. That's not gonna work. So after we've gathered all the data, we have some idea of what's going on, we'll often present all this information to our leadership in some kind of graph or chart form, some kind of infographic form. There's a little bit more of that that we covered in chapter three. And I mentioned a little bit before uh, the chicken or the egg, is it data mining, is it statistics, which of the two, which come first, are they the same, what's going on between the two of them? 
while they're pretty close in in scope of some of the things that they look at, um, statistics is typically the the first step um, in the data mining process. It's often a foundation of data mining. The difference really within the two of them is when we start looking at statistics, for instance, we have a well-defined idea of what's going to happen or what we think we're going to find. And then we use the process of statistics to support or refute our hypothesis. So we might want to say that 75% of people coming into the supermarket the day before the football game are going to buy pretzels. And then we go to the data mining to see if we can support or refute our argument. Versus starting off with data mining, we tend to do this a little more broadly. And in that same question, we may say that on the day before the Super Bowl, what do consumers buy the most often at the grocery store? Uh, or what items do they buy most often? And then we can target our ad based, our, our pricing and our marketing all around around that data that we find. So while stats usually comes in with a hypothesis that we have to support or refute, data mining is a little loosey-goosey. We're trying to have a concept of what it is that we're looking for, and then we let the data speak and make inferences uh, from there. Data mining also relies on massive data warehouses, data stores. We, we don't limit the amount of data. In fact, we're looking for patterns. The more data, the merrier. And stats, when anything working in statistics comes up against a data set that's too big, we'll often take a sample of it. You don't usually run statistics on the entire population of the United States. You may run a sample across multiple different states or demographics or small, um, smaller subsets of people and then make a generalization from what you find. Some of the applications that people may use of it, and this is not a software application, this is how you might apply it. Customer relationship management, upselling, trying to find your customers that come back the most often, um, or keep those customers with your brand a little bit longer. Uh, in the banking, could help with the loan process, um, in also helping identify fraudulent transactions. Uh, if you've ever been shopping somewhere and then and tri and then took a trip somewhere else later in that day and purchased something at the airport, it's very likely you could get a fraud alert from your company saying, hmm, you don't typically buy this. And we also see this a lot with online transactions. Uh, you typically buy everything domestically and then all of a sudden a charge pops up from Indonesia. Um, you're in your U.S. based, your, comp your credit card company might say, hmm, this seems strange uh, and, and reach out to you and operating cash reserves with forecasting, taking a look at what we need to have on hand from the aspect of our business based on historical data and how trends go over the seasons or months. For instance, we have some more in here around retail logistics and manufacturing that use them very much along the same lines to predict how their business needs to operate. Uh, the same with brokerage security trading, obviously a lot with the stock market and our insurance as well looks a lot at our habitual data <clears throat> and then tries to predict how we will behave in the future to even do everything from claims rate uh, all the way through the likelihood that we'll be in, a, in an accident. And those actuaries are working awfully hard to produce that data for us. Um, and it is literally virtually everywhere in every industry that you can think of, stats or data mining are the name of the game. So what is a process for data mining? Um, and it is kind of a combination of a lot of best practices all together. So we may have moving from an art to a science for a data mining project. Uh, this is, you know, we're, we're going from, we wanna um, kind of high level answer how we should run our business. And then we get into the data mining and all of those best practices and workflows that we typically use. And it turns into um, a very structured assignment versus something that might be a little bit artistic. Everybody has their own flavor of doing this. Some common methods across industry standard process for data mining, CRISP, SEMA, sample, explore, modify, model, and assess, and the KDD, knowledge discovery in databases. Um, while CRISP and SEMA are often used um, and, and are certainly popular, KDD, the act of finally kind of just getting into the database and searching around is, is really getting um, more traction. So the first one here, CRISP-DM, proposed in the 90s, six steps. Understand what the business 
is doing. Understand what the business is capable of and what kind of data it stores uh, is the second step and um, how how it's there, why it's there. Data prep, starting to take a look at that data and do any cleaning that we have to do. Build the model of how we're going to get in and start digging around our data um, to navigate, to build, uh, to build our, our, our mining. Testing and evaluation, does it actually work? Are we getting the results that we thought we should get? Are we getting results at all? And then actually deploying um, whatever program that we're trying to do around our data mining. Most of our time is spent in the early steps, understanding the business, the data, and then getting it prepped and ready to be mined. And there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen in all of our data. The second one, SEMA, understanding the business, understanding the data prep. This all sort of continues along the same for each of the processes, slightly different names. We're going to sample, explore the data, modify our variables, modify our model, assess, and then sample again and kind of just continue to go around. So those often have, uh, between CRISP and SEMA, pretty, pretty similar steps, just called something slightly different. KDD gets, a, gets it as well. Uh, there is a little bit more uh, just kind of poking around in the database. In my opinion, uh, you spend a little bit more time exploring and understanding what's in there. We have the sources. Our, we're going to data select, clean, transform it. And then from that data mine set that we have after that, we're going to uh, do our discovery. And then we kind of reflect back on that. Is this what we thought we'd find? Is this answering our question? Uh, or do we have to pivot and go a completely different direction? What's the best method? Doesn't matter. The best method is specific to uh, your business, your company, and your way of working. Uh, so the book makes this assertion that CRISP is the best. And I do love to argue with a textbook, and I'll certainly do it here as well. Um, there is no best process. Your process is your own, your company's own. Um, unless that process is broken and never gives you results, well, then it's probably not the best. So while I'd love to say I agree with this, I certainly don't. But I do want to share that it is it is up to you. It is what works, what, what gives us data, and what the company is willing to tolerate along doing that. Data mining and our classification is one method um, that is used the most often in many companies. There's some machine learning that can help us with this. Um, and you can learn from that past data and help classify new information. So uh, the data outputs are categorical. We talked a little bit about nominal and ordinal. Um, what's the difference between classification and regression? In regression, we're trying to figure out what variables affected the output. And with the classification, we're just trying to understand a little bit more of certain clusters got created or certain uh, groups got created. We'll talk about clustering in just a moment. I know it's on that slide, but there are some better visual representations coming up. So here's a model for our classification. This is not a math class, so please do not feel like you will have to memorize any formulas. Uh, we will not do that <clears throat> in this class. Um, in the classification problems, the primary source, the primary source for accuracy estimation is our confusion matrix. So we take a look at the predicted class of data. If it's true, observed, it's positive, negative. And if it's true and observed, it's positive and it's something that we have predicted, then we classify that as a positive. Either we predicted it would be positive or negative, uh, could go either in those squares and then if it's a negative observed and we couldn't predict it, then it's kind of a, a negative classification of that data. We won't work too much with the confusion model, anything with this matrix. Um, we'll focus on a different model for us, but the classification model is definitely one that exists of where we think um, our attitude towards certain data will be. Then there's a simple split. Um, it could be a single, uh, or it could be uh, simple, depending on the, the different types of data that you wish to test. Um, uh, you can split the data into mutually exclusive groups, like a training and a testing, develop your model against it, score it, and then do an accuracy prediction against, against that data. Another method here is the K-fold. Data is split into however many subsets with however many experiments against that data, and you repeat it. 10 times for each subset of data until you can begin to understand what your model is, is showing.
Again, we won't spend too much time on this one as well. Cluster analysis that I just meant a few uh, just mentioned a few moments ago helps us identify those natural groupings in uh, groups of data. I would argue that in data mining, cluster analysis, k-means clustering, um, and association mining are the tools that not only are are more frequently used, but are also really just easier tools to to work with. And therefore, um, I think a lot of people are less intimidated to work with them and, and may, um, may default to them a little bit more. Also, this is a part of machine learning. You can do cluster analysis inside of Excel with a little bit of add-on, which uses um, an Azure data model to help do some data clustering. Clustering learns some things in the past and then assigns new instances. There's not a target output, there's no variable it tries to find patterns in all of the data that it's looking for, and then will help us segment that into different classes um, of our data. You can use it to identify groups of customers, um, new cases for targeting people or customers or sales or diagnostic purposes. We can characterize, define, or label populations of people. Um, we can decrease the size and complexity of problems for other data mining models. Some of them work a little better in smaller amounts. Clustering can handle an awful lot of data sets, and we'll see that in just a second. And we can also identify outliers. Those could be rare events, things or people or tasks or times that we just want to avoid based on their outcome. It uses a lot of statistical methods to determine how to map data. Uh, some neural networks. Some fuzzy logic, that's a C-means algorithm, we won't go into there, and some other general algorithms. We also have our K-means clustering. K-means is another one um, of the other types that I mentioned that I find are used a little more easily and uh, are readily accessible. You can do K-means clustering very simply in Excel. Um, we've done examples of this in past times that I've taught this course. Um, and I'm moving away from it to an a priori, which I think is a little bit uh, better for us to use and understand. You'll randomly generate a number of points as the initial cluster center centers. It can be one, two, three, however many pieces of data you may be trying to, to test to see if anything um, aligns with it. Assign each point to the nearest center of the cluster and do this again and again until you have all of your data associated with some, some concept of a cluster. So I have an example here. In step one, we have all of our data points in here. And we may choose, in this instance, five data points um, to evaluate all of the other data against and see if it comes any closer to a cluster. One of these cluster center points that we identify could be something that we're trying to get to. Um, we think that certain demographics of people like to see certain types of movie, and that could be an age likes to see a certain type of movie. It could be um, about uh, where people are willing to shop based on um, other factors in that shop, uh, you know, lighting, cleanliness, selection, if it's uh, a box store or what have you. And then we can use some statistical analysis against each one of those clusters to measure the distance of the observed value to one of those center points that we've identified. And then the model will move data closer or farther away from each of those points based on the data it's testing. And then you might say, oh, wow, when I look at this in step three, which is when the model has looked at all data, gosh, whatever is around that upper left data point seems to be the tightest cluster. And um, whatever is going on in there, we need to investigate a little further. There could be a winning combination. We have some outliers in the upper right. And... Uh, green's pretty close together. Let's take a look at that shop and some of its characteristics. There may be something there for us to incorporate in our business as well. Association role mining is where we are going to spend some time uh, in some examples. And then also this is what our homework will be. I think association role mining is fascinating. Uh, and it's a very popular way to conduct data mining. It finds interesting relationships or affinities between any kind of variable. It's also machine learning. Um, there is no necessarily output variable, and it's often called market basket analysis. And you'll see why in just a moment. 
But one of the examples I have here is we're going to see the relationship between diapers and beers. Uh, and there's plenty of other uh, associations as well that we can look at. Some of the inputs that we have would come from our transaction system, all of the millions of sales that we have in our Target store or our whatever store. We're gonna take a look at every single one of those transactions, those shopping receipts. We're gonna look in the shopping basket of everybody going to whatever grocery store to see if we can find some patterns, some frequencies amongst all of the people. How many people are coming into our store buying diapers and also buying beer and also buying cookies and also buying milk? Um, how often does that happen? And then we can start to draw some conclusions based on some of that data. Um, an ex another example here, a customer bought a laptop and virus protection also bought the extended service plan 70% of the time. Um, and so what we'll do is we will take a look at the patterns in our shopping carts and try to determine how often something happens. In business, this is super important for us. Uh, if I'm selling chips or dips, I'm going to want to market the complementary item for that to try to drive sales in that particular area. Uh, in medicine, we can find the relationships between symptoms and illness. If you, com if you commonly have a, a runny nose and a little bit of a fever and you're tired, well, then you may have the flu, um, potentially either based on certain times of the year or other symptoms. And we can do that with association rule mining. Uh, it's not just for, for chips. So we'll have a couple of things that we'll look at here. Um, as part of doing this, we have products and services. Left hand, we have products and services. We have left hand side, right hand side. We'll explain those in a minute. Support, uh, how often X and Y go together, how often chips and beer go together. And we also have confidence, how often uh, Y goes together with the X. So um, they, uh, will both together help us be more confident in the answer that we're giving has a, as a percentage of happen, uh, happening. So when we think of um, the laptop and computer and the extended service plan, they may happen 70% uh, of the time uh, together. A couple of different types of association rule mining algorithms we'll look at a priori the ECLAT, FP growth, and some derivatives of all those together. We are going to spend our time in a priori. Uh, and I think this will, this will make the most sense to all of us as a method of data mining. And its frequency of item sets is sort of that key. The a priori algorithm finds the subset uh, that are common to the least minute minimum number of item sets. We're going to present a number of item sets, one through five item sets. Each item set will have a different letter in it. And we're going to try to find how often certain patterns of a subset of those items appear. Think of, you know, if we have A, B, and C, D, we may think of those things that you would buy at the grocery store. And we're just calling them A, B, C, and D in here. So I think this will um, make a lot of sense uh, as we take a look at it. So here's an example of how a priori algorithm works. So we have uh, on the left side here, raw transaction data. So we have a number of transactions, one of them ending in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. In shopping cart two, one, two, three, four, this customer bought SKU items one, two, three, and four. In shopping cart ending in five, they bought three items, two, three, and four. In six, they bought two and three. In shopping cart seven, they bought three items, one, two, and four. In eight, they bought four items, one, two, three, and four. And in shopping cart nine, they bought two items, two and four. If we were looking to mine one item data sets, um, item sets, if we looked at uh, the item set number one, um, the SKU number one, Going back to those shopping carts, how many times does number one appear in all of those columns? Well, it applies, it appears in the shopping cart four, that's one. It ap applies in, it appears in shopping cart seven, that's two. And it, ap it appears in, I can't say that right. <laughs> it appears in shopping cart eight, one. Uh, so that gives us three. So when we look at skew for number one, the support is three. 
<clears throat> moving down, uh, skew two appears in four, that's one, five, that's two, six, that's three, seven, that's four, eight, that's five, and it appears in nine, it appears six times. So we see the support is six. So for three and four, we do the same thing. We just go back to those skews and count how many times it appears. So that's for one item set. Then we're gonna go into the two item sets. And we are going to look at how often one and two, excuse one and two, appear in all of those shopping carts. So if I'm looking for one and two, they have to be together. It appears in cart four, that's the first time. It appears in cart seven, that's the second time. And it appears in cart eight, that's the third time. Our support is three. If we look at the combination of one and three, one and three appears in shopping cart four, and it appears not again until shopping cart eight. That's a support of two. If we look at item set one and four, it appears in shopping cart four, it appears in shopping cart seven, and it appears in shopping cart ending in eight. So that's three times. Hopefully doing that, flipping back to that first one, you can see how I'm counting those. Well, then let's take a look at item sets that are three. And you'll often start at three. Sometimes we'll tell you how far to go, but we're in this case just gonna go to three. Item set appearing in one, two, and four. Well, that appears, one, two, and four appears in shopping cart four, that's one. It appears in shopping cart ending in seven, that's two. And it appears in shopping cart ending in eight, that is uh, three. So you can see my support is three. Item set and uh, with SKUs 2, 3, and 4, we see that in shopping cart ending in 4. We see that in shopping cart ending in 5. And we don't see that again until we get to shopping cart 8. So the support there is 3. Could you go to a fourth item set um, and identify shopping cart three, uh, ending in 4 and shopping cart ending in 8 as each having 1, 2, 3, and 4? Yes, you could. However, and something that we'll talk about next is the concept of minimum support. So minimum support means while we do all of this counting, if, it, if the number of support does not equal to or go above our minimum support number, we would exclude those. So in this case, if we had a minimum support of two, um, everything would have to be counted twice or above to continue to move into the next classification. And most things here do. I don't see anything that's just a one, but we do stop at three. So let's take this a little bit further. In this instance, this situation here, I have four shopping carts, 10, 20, 30, and 40. And right above that, I have identified a minimum support of two. If something does not have at least a pattern where it appears twice, we're going to ignore it. Let's get started. Item set one. We're looking for A, B, C, D, and E. Well, we're gonna do our first scan across that data. Looking for item set A in our orange shopping cart, A appears twice in 10 and in 30. So it has a support of two. In looking at scanning for B, B appears three times. It appears in 20, 30, and 40. It has a support of two. C appears three times in 10, 20, 30. D only appears once in 10, and E appears three times, 20, 30, and 40. Because our minimum support is two, we will discount D in this pass, and it will look like this, because uh, it does not meet the minimum support of two. So we have A, B, C, and E. Now we're gonna take a second pass and look for two item sets in this data. And this is going to be C2 or classification two, combination two, whatever you want to whatever you want to call it. We're only going to consider items in pairs of two that also have a support of two. Okay, so when we look back at our cart of A and B, A and B appears one time. That only appears in 30. When we look at A and C, a and C appear twice. It appears in 10 and it appears in 30. A and E, and you can just see we're taking A, B, A, C, A, E, B, C, B, E, C, E. We want to have every possible combination of those letters. So A and C is twice and that appears in 10 and 30. 
A and E only appears once, and that's in 30. B and C appears twice, and that's in 20 and 30. B and E appears three times, that's in 20, 30, and 40. And C and E appears twice, that happens in 20 and 30. Again, our minimum support is two, so we will take A and E out of that, uh, as well as A and B, and now we have our minimum support items, A, C, B, C, B, E, C, E. In the back of your mind, you can call this bread, milk, butter, and eggs, for instance, if you want, or bread, beer, butter, eggs, whatever makes you happy. But in this instance, we're just going to look at the letters. So now we're going to go for a third pass, a third scan. And in this instance, we're going to look for combinations of three. What combination of three letters appears most often up here? ACD, only one. ACE, only one one, A, B, C, only one. The only combination that appears three times is B, C, E, and it appears twice. So these are all of our scans and all of our passes. So I scan it and then I pass out, pass off only the ones that meet the minimum support. And then I go to the item set again, where there's a pair of two. I scan everything for a pair of two, count everything up, and I pass on only those items that meet the minimum support. Item set three, same thing. What thing could appear three times? I can make all the different combinations. Um, I, I made it a little shorter here so I can get it all on the slide and said BCE, BCE or P e appears twice. That's as far as this algorithm can go. The algorithm terminates. Could we say there's a fourth? Well, we could. A, B, C, and E is certainly four, but how many times does that appear? only once. Because our minimum support is two, that would not advance. Our algorithm terminates at BCE with two. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense to you. Um, while it's not overly magical to hear my voice over and over again, I would walk through that last example again. Rewind it, listen to it again, do it on Excel on your computer uh, or a notebook and, and run through those passes as well because it's going to help you. What software do we have out there to do a lot of this? Well, we can use SPSS, uh, and that is extremely expensive, and we have some others as well. What most people are moving towards is the very last one, R. R Studio is free, and with some short lessons on our friend YouTube, you too can become an R Studio master and, and do some data mining yourself. What are some pitfalls? Selecting the wrong problem for data mining. There are problems that cannot be solved or answered with data mining. Ignoring what your sponsor, your company, your boss thinks uh, and it, of what it can and can't do. Um, beginning without the end in mind. We do not want to create a database without first understanding the different ways we might want to pull data in the future so that we can uh, make sure that we're capturing the right thing. Don't start a data mining problem without a concept of what it is that you're trying to find in, in the end. Don't go in just trying to fish and solve for a problem or an answer. Have an idea of what you're looking for before you go in. It's going to take eternity times two to get together all of your data to clean it and get it ready for data mining. Do not underestimate how long it will take just for that step alone. And looking only at the aggregated results and not individual records or predictions. Sometimes you see those results all high level. We saw B, C, and E, but let's go take a look at what's going on in that shopping cart and, and, and dig a little further into something else that maybe happened. There's a few more mistakes there in your book, but these are the ones that I kind of just wanted to start with. So your assignment is to do what we just did here on this slide. I've changed it up a little bit more and added a few more items to the shopping cart. So you're going to use the a priori algorithm against this item set, milk, bread, eggs, cookies, beer, I'm sorry, butter, coffee, and juice. Your minimum support is two. Basically recreate this in Excel for me. Excel will be your friend here and show me how far you can get in combination sets with two as the minimum support. How many passes will it take? That it could take a few. Eh. You're going to have to start with one item set, then two item sets, then three item sets, and four item sets. 
I can tell you the answer is not a four item set because a four item set only appears once in this data set, transaction 108. And because it only appears once, it will not meet the minimum support of two. So if your final answer is four items, you have passed go and it's not the correct answer. So I won't tell you what it is, but I'll help you with what it isn't. Again, please go back to working through this example uh, for understanding. Do it as a practice once or twice, and then come here and work through this item set in the a priori algorithm. If you have any questions, as always, please send me an email and I'm here to help if I can. Thank you so much.